Hey guys, Josh from Depth Ape Channel, and today we're going to be working on, I think I'm going to call this the mullet truck, and the reason for that is, looks like a standard business truck up front, but go to the back, whole different state of affairs. He has more of a, a like a fifth wheel setup than your normal big old kingpin. He's got a single axle, everything's been... Uh, Rhino line here, really cool looking truck. Huge stacks, look at those things. Pretty cool truck, it's got a cat in it. I believe it's a C12, brought it to me to look it over, so let's go do that. So this is the cat C12 that the customer has in the truck, and you can see it's pretty clean. Uh, not covered in dirt and oil. Appears to have a new oil pan on it, but found out that it's not a new oil pan. The customer actually removed it, resealed it, just cleaned the heck out of it to the point that it looks brand new. Cat, cat filters all the way around, which is awesome. It even has a cat uh, coolant additive. It's not a filter, but people call them filters. Just looking for anything weird here. Uh, it does have what appears to be some fuel slobber, possibly coming out of the exhaust manifold. Always check our oil level, just for anything weird. Oil looks pretty clean, right, pretty much right in the middle of the, uh, not the full mark, but right in the middle of the, the hash marks there. So good oil level clean oil and he'd said it only been a couple hundred miles since he pulled the oil pan off so uh green coolant and it looks pretty low it could probably take about two gallons I'm not sure when the last time he had checked it is but it is low a little concerning if you know you don't see a leak but it does have some loss of coolant somewhere interior is very nice uh, all the gauges switches everything nothing's broken apart like the headliner looks brand new uh, really nice truck all the way around from what I could tell. It's got this uh, rubber matting on there, even Kenworth floor mats there. So starting it up just to see if anything's weird. There's no active codes. Uh, you can see it was a little chilly out here. This is actually like the first day of summer and the low that day was 44. So you can see that the truck temp there is like 55 degrees. Beep. Horn doesn't work there. Oh well, gonna start it up. Like I said, you're supposed to honk the horn before you start any engine at Western States, but horn doesn't work, not sure what to do. Start it right up with no problem. Nothing apparent yet. Uh, low on air, normal. Just looking for anything weird. Do we have a coolant sensor that is reading out of place do we have a boost pressure sensor oil pressure anything that could lead us to why it's running weird we're gonna do it's not necessarily running horribly it just at idle it seems to have a little bit of a I guess they'd call it a stumble and with no codes could it could it be mechanical yes could it be fuel pressure yes so we're gonna do a cylinder cutout test do them all the time uh, I'm gonna speed it up but basically do I do a Sonar cutout test, yes. Did I find anything? No, no I did not. It's got these uh, tie downs, pretty cool. Stacks, a little bit of smoke, but it's cold out. Got it in the shop here, and we're gonna start doing some troubleshooting. That's our fuel pressure, and that's the unfiltered side, so just over 30 PSI. If you go to that plug right there, that's actually the filtered side, so that's the one that the injectors uh, fuel supply is getting so we're gonna move our gauge to there of course it can't generally it can't be higher after the filter so what is it close to about the same a little bit lower but that's our filtered fuel pressure so what's the specification from cat well 65 to 85 at 600 rpm and this one idles at 600 rpm so his fuel pressure is about half of what it should be now is that necessarily causing the problem we don't know that yet, but we're gonna troubleshoot it. We're getting our regulator out here. And these don't have a self-contained regulator. It's basically a plunger and a spring. And unfortunately, I don't have another one to test with, so we had to order a set to make sure that that is not causing our problem. And while we waited for those, I'm gonna get to the destruction of the week. But before we do that, I'm gonna talk about this video sponsor, which is... And we're gonna be doing a little science experiment with today's sponsor of this video, which is Viver Jax. And I've been using this one air jack, this one, the older one, or the older looking one, since last summer. 
And it's pretty simple design. It's just a big truck airbag, basically, with a ram, a centering ram in the center of it. And it works really good for medium-duty trucks, front ends of motorhomes, delivery vehicles like this. It'll obviously work for cars, light trucks, stuff like that. But one thing it, I found that doesn't really work too good on because it's rated at 11,000 pounds is big trucks like this Kenworth, which have a C15 cat in them. It will not lift the front end up, which makes sense. These front ends are very heavy. They can be 15, 20,000 pounds. And this one I put two by fours under the tire so I could get under the front axle, but I need to lift it back up. And to do that, I'm gonna try two of them. So I've got this T set up I had to make. That's not part of the jacks, but we're gonna be using both instead of one big 10 ton jack. And these are a lot less expensive than one big 10 ton jack. And they're a lot lighter. So it's also nice too, if you're gonna be using two individual jacks, because a lot of times when you lift with a large single jack, the truck tends to tilt one or the other. It'll lift one side first. And this way, if it'll lift them, which I believe it will, it will not teeter do any of that. Now, obviously the problem here is I should have ran some sort of valve to compensate so they're each equally lifting at the same time. So what I was doing here is running each control so that it looked like they were lifting evenly. But wanted to make sure it would actually work. These are nice little jacks. It'd be really good for a car or something to have if you have air uh, to lift it right up. But look at that. Lifted it right up no problem evenly. Thank you to Viva for sponsoring this video. This week's destruction of the week comes from Jesse, and Jesse was working on a Cummins, and you don't want to find this in your oil pan, folks. It looks like half of the engine is sitting in the oil pan. While not half the engine, you can see the piston there, it is actually the, basically the liner, and part of the block here of this Cummins engine just decided to kind of disintegrate. You can see the piston there is also pretty messed up, uh, distorted, not sure exactly what happened here, but pretty interesting to see the piston in there and no, uh, not inside of a cylinder, just inside of a bare bore. So thank you for those pictures. Let's get back to work here. So the customer also wanted the overhead ran. So that's what I'm doing here. Obviously you do not need to do the overhead to test for fuel pressure problems, but you can see I've already pulled off the intake tubing. I've pulled off the number one valve cover assembly and the C10s and C12s. If they have Jake brakes, which these do, you're gonna have that extra spacer between the valve cover base and the valve covers, and there's three valve covers, and these have Jake, so it has that extra spacer there, and I'll be showing you how to reseal those later in the video here, but just gonna kind of go over some of the overhead specifications for the C12. I've got other videos on how to do them, but just kinda wanna go over it since I was doing it on this engine anyway. Now, I did blow off between the valve covers with air, but what I've been doing a lot more lately is when I get the valve covers off, if there's dirt, which generally there is, and especially on the C12 where you have really tall spacers and valve covers between each other, you get a lot of dirt build up, so I'm trying to pay more attention to getting all the dirt out before getting deep into the engine. Now, could you do the overhead with the Jake housings on? Maybe. Uh, the, the adjusters are, you're able to get to those. And the C12s are kind of weird because they're exhaust intake, intake exhaust as far as the valve uh, rocker arm layout. But the injectors would be really hard to get to if you had the jakes on uh, as far as adjusting them. So I just pulled them off just to do it correctly. We're gonna be using a 15 and a 25 thousandths, which coincidentally, the jake setting on these is 40 thousandths. So if you were to take your intake and exhaust uh, feeler gauges here, you would have a 40 thousandths feeler gauge. I didn't end up using that. I ended up using a 19 and a 21. Uh, so they're more uniformly thick, but you could have used both. Now that doesn't mean all C12s use a 40 thousandths, just this particular one. It varies by which Jake housings you have. So I was checking them here. I've been more, I'm not sure what the word would be, but I've tried to be more patient, whereas before I would always just loosen them all and, ch and then just set them. Now I like to spend the extra five minutes and check them first. So at least you know 
Are they loose? Are they tighter? Or are they okay? If they're okay, I'll actually just recheck the nut torque, but generally they're not what I like to feel. And these ones, they pretty much all feel loose to me. So we're gonna loosen them all up and the lock nuts that is, and then just set them. So it's a good way to tell too if let's say they were all loose but one was really tight or they were all tight and one was really loose or something like that, you might wanna start looking more thoroughly at that cylinder or that cam lobe, rocker, whatever. Doing my normal setup where I put the feeler gauge in, run it down past tight, then back it off, then torque the lock nut. Pretty much how I always do valves. Now this one I kinda wanna go over because I see people misinstall these cut to length seals a lot. And this is, like I said, if it has jakes, which this one does, it's gonna have the spacer. And they use this 5 Paul 5, 7, or 5, 6, 7, 8 uh, cut to length seal. And a lot of the cat engines did. The older ones particularly, C7s use them, 3126 is C15, well, more of the 346Es, but the C10, C12s used them. And basically this is just a length of seal, and I'm using some gray RTV silicone here. Anyone know what RTV stands for? I do. Leave it in the comments if you know what it is. It's room temperature vulcanizing if you didn't know. But basically, I just kind of want to show you the correct way to install this. So I see a lot of people, they put these in there. They don't put sealant on the ends. And sometimes you get a little oil weepage through there. You don't need a ton of silicone. You also do not need to put silicone over the entire length. I have seen that before. And boy, is that fun to clean off. No, you really only need some silicone wherever you have the joints that meet because you have basically three flanges there. And anytime you have three flanges, you wanna use some sort of sealant and that is where silicone is best. So we're gonna cut it, not to the very end, but we're gonna get about a quarter inch gap because it's gonna kind of squish together. And where they squish together, you're gonna put a little more silicone. Now the silicone there, like I said, you don't need a ton. It actually helps them seat against each other also because if you put them together dry, sometimes you are gonna have a really hard time pushing the other one next to the one that's already in place. So the silicone actually acts partially as a lubricant, and then it's obviously going to dry and turn into kind of like a vulcanized material. And there you go. Like I said, you don't need a ton. You can add a little more there if you want to, but that's pretty much all you need. Once that is all installed, you are ready to set it in place. Now what you don't want to do is set this in place and then go take lunch for an hour. What you want to do is immediately do the next one, which would be the valve cover that goes over this, and then tighten them down, and then do them on the next set. Because obviously the silicone will only dry once, and you don't want it to dry before it is uh, squished in place. So like I said, you just set that there, and these valve cover spacers are not reversible. You, they only go one way, basically. So getting ready to put the intake tubing back on, I was like, let me look at the turbo real fast. Looks a little wet. Maybe, I'm not sure what's going on there. It might be pushing a little bit of oil. It's not really wet. It's got a little more free play. And it's got some axial and some side to side, but it's not contacting the housing, so it is still usable here. And we've got our new spring and plunger. You can see the new plunger has kind of the grayish coloring to it. The other one's just the silver color. New spring also. Yeah, you like that sticker, don't ya? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little bit of oil on this plunger before we put it in. We don't want to put it in without any sort of lubrication. It might seize or gall when the first time it's moving. So any good idea, anytime you have anything metal to metal to lubricate it, I would recommend, even if it's not necessarily in a lubricated or oil passage, like this is a fuel system, but I put engine oil on it because engine oil is a very good lubricant. It literally is just a lubricant. So. Just gonna put that in and seat it and get our spring, seat that. Then we need to get our fitting on and hopefully that fixed it. Now, do I think it fixed it? Uh, maybe not. The new spring doesn't really seem any tighter, but before we start it up, since it's been off here for a day or two, I was doing the overhead and waiting on the spring and plunger, the oil level is higher than it was out there before. So if you remember before it was right in the middle of the hash marks, now it's on the set of the first L of full. And I did check it a couple times. It wasn't like I just checked it once. And kind of weird. Because I haven't done anything. I haven't added any oil. And hasn't been running. 
So let's check. Uh oh. So that's not good. So that means, which there is moisture and air, folks, but this is inside the crankcase, so any sort of rust in there is not usually a good sign. Now the customer had sent me his oil samples, and he actually had a little bit of coolant contamination. His oil samples, not a lot, but a little bit, and he also had a little bit of fuel dilution in his uh, oil samples also, which may explain the no, the very clean looking oil, but the fuel dilution was very low and the coolant dilution was very low also. It was just more than normal. Now, he hasn't been complaining about loss of coolant really, although the coolant level is low. He hasn't really been complaining about losing fuel or losing oil pressure or his oil level climbing. So, since he doesn't use this truck much, um, only a couple thousand miles per year, I believe. Is that probably the best thing to do instead of tearing the whole thing down looking for it? Probably at this point, probably just monitor it. Now, what I'm doing here is I've loosened the drain plug, sped this up, and I'm just seeing, because it's sat for a couple days, do we get any coolant or water out of this? Or are we just gonna get oil? Now, the reason I'm doing that is because obviously the drain plug's usually at the lowest point in the pan. So if you did have coolant that was getting in there, you'd probably get coolant first out of your drain plug here. But as you can see, just looks like oil to me. Haven't got any coolant coming out of here. I don't wanna drain it all either because there's not a lot of oil um, or there's not much mileage on this oil. So we're just getting a couple drips out of here. And yeah, I don't see any really reason to drain it all out. I, we're, we're, not, we're not seeing coolant or fuel in here. Which fuel obviously mixes with oil, so that's the only way you could really tell is if the oil level is rising and you're losing oil pressure. So this is with the new plunger. And yeah, it's, it's identical. So we need to do some troubleshooting now, more in depth. And what we're doing here is we're bypassing the whole fuel system up to the transfer pump. And if the fuel pressure changes, meaning it increases, now it's doing something kind of weird here. I've moved the gauge too to the unfiltered side, so it's gonna be a little higher than it was before. Now here is the list of what Cat tells you can cause low fuel pressure. Plugged fuel filters, debris in the check valve and the hand priming pump. I have never seen that. Not exactly sure how that would cause low fuel pressure, but uh, fuel relief valve and the fuel transfer pump, that's kind of the next thing it wants you to check. And you can have plug lines, all sorts of stuff. But basically what we're gonna do is we are going to check our fuel transfer pump and the line going from the pump to the filter housing. So we've put our main line feed line on there because that didn't change the fuel pressures. And what we did is we pulled that line off and we're just looking that it's clear going right into our test port here, which it is, so we know we don't have a restriction there. Now the hand priming pump is after that fitting or the line, so you know that cannot be positive. So specification is 105 to 113 PSI if dead end in the pump. Now it's also 2100 RPM, but the relief spring pressure doesn't change based on RPM. Just the volume changes. So we've got it deadheaded here, and we're only at 85 PSI, which makes me think this pump is not capable of blowing enough fuel to reach that pressure when it's deadheaded. And it's an original pump, you can tell because it's painted and it looks like it's been on there forever. Look at that! Inverted recessed Torx bits. Why would you do that to me, Cat? It was a little worn, but obviously it was still working enough to run the engine, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's flowing enough or up to par for idle. So these are our gears. It's just a twin gear pump, two bearings. Well, I mean, there's bearings on both sides, so I guess four bearings, but very simple. Doesn't even have a gasket. That looks like they just use a sealant. And they are, uh, they're keyed. And you can see there's quite a bit of slop. So we're moving those gears like an eighth of a turn, and it's not even moving the, uh, the drive gear there. Now maybe that's normal, but it seems sloppy to me. But I think the main problem is actually the relief is kind of leaking and it's allowing fuel to just kind of recirculate. So uh, since we've dead ended it, all that, we ordered a new pump. Now it did take over a week to get, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but you can see the new pump here is quite a bit different design. The where the ports are, the relief, this looks a lot more and it might be actually the same as on the C15s. You can see bigger difference there. And the old one has a bigger body and 
it's split differently too. So I definitely like this newer pump better. And we're gonna install it. It also came with an updated line because the ports are in slightly different location. And here's something kind of weird that I've never noticed, although not that I've done a ton of C12 transfer pumps. They actually have sealing washers, kind of like AC systems and some bolts through the front structures on the fuel transfer pump here. And if you drop them, you gotta pick them back up. But anyway, it must have oil going to that bolt hole, so that must be why they use a sealing washer. Interesting. Anywho, so we got that back on there. And what we're gonna do is runner. But before we do that, I just wanna paint it. Last thing I wanna do is put cast metal parts on and not paint them at all. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, you should have painted it while it was off. Yes, I always go back and forth on that. So it's harder to paint them when they're installed, correct? But if they're off and you're painting them, you have more likelihood to get paint on parts that are gonna be inside the engine. Starter up here. So I generally I'll paint after it's on the engine. Well, it looks to me, although we're gonna have to get a little closer, that we've got a big old increase in fuel pressure, folks. Look at that, 75 PSI, hey! That's really good. So 75 PSI, that is well within specification now. 65 to 85 is the specification at 600 RPM. Now it's still an, a diesel engine idling at 600 RPM, so it's not, you know, it's not sewing this machine smooth, but all of the kind of hunting or stumbling that it was doing before seems to have gone. No smoke either. Now, of course, it was a much warmer day here than it was the other day when it was running, so maybe the smoke was caused by temperature. Pretty much it on that one. This is the new engine for Smoky Red. And a keen eye will notice Cat did something wrong when they put this engine together. Leave in the comments if you know what it is. I'd like to thank the owner of the mullet truck for bringing it in, and hopefully it runs good for him. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Thanks for watching.